All right, guys, welcome back to F1 News. The Chinese Grand Prix is this weekend, but the driver market questions continue to rage on in the background. Rumour has it today that Audi have given Carlos Sainz effectively an ultimatum, saying, look, make a decision by the end of this weekend, by the end of the Chinese Grand Prix, as to whether you will join Audi and therefore Sauer for 2025, 6 and beyond. That means that if Carlos Sainz has received, as we believe, an offer from Mercedes on a one plus one basis, that decision needs to be made ASAP. Also rumours that after Alex Albon's recent couple of crashes, that he is no longer as much in consideration for Red Bull as he previously was. Very much on Twitter, your thoughts in the comments below. Hit the like button if you enjoy. Subscribe if you're new as always. I would greatly appreciate it. First of all, here's Valtteri Bottas on the Shanghai International Circuit earlier today. As you can tell, it's rather wet out there. And this is going to be an important factor, I would say, here for the weekends because, well, I think the track's been resurfaced. Certainly, I think the surface is different to when they were last here back in 2019. So the data these teams will base their setups off is not going to be especially conclusive. And it probably will create some chaos this weekend with one practice session straight into sprint qualifying, straight into the sprint race on the Saturday morning. This is uh, Bottas's cycling route as of yesterday. But yeah, the skies have been very rainy. It's been raining today. It is meant to rain tomorrow as well, potentially. Certainly Friday night. The current forecast says... Probably the sessions will be dry, but Friday night it will rain and potentially some drizzle on Saturday, potentially on Sunday. So I'd say on the balance of probabilities, there's probably not going to be any rain during the sessions, but it will affect the weekend in some way because they will race. Well, they won't race, but they'll do qualifying for the sprint race on Friday night. Then overnight, it's probably going to rain pretty heavily. So when they get to the track for the sprints, it's going to be a very green track. And as is talked about, here with the new resurfacing you know some of the oil coming up to the top surface it's going to be slippery out there you can tell already with Bottas on his bike certainly that's going to be true when the cars hit the track this of course is also a sprint weekend just wanted to mention an interesting analysis here from the race on exactly what this means for Formula 1 because if you guys aren't aware they've changed the format this weekend so it now looks like this so we've got practice one the sprint shootout which is sprint quality on the Friday then the sprint on the Saturday morning then main quality then the Grand Prix to me this should make for a better weekend just because we now have two park Fermi. So um, if you mess up your setup for sprint quality in the sprint itself, you can change that before qualifying. So um, it should mean that the sprint isn't just a carbon copy of what the race is going to be, but it does mean the sprint's value seems to decrease because last year it was sprint Saturday, right? When the Saturday was just the sprint day, they did shootout and quali. So, and then they did the Grand Prix quali on the Friday. I don't think that's as good as this, but what it does effectively do is devalue the sprint to some degree. That's the point that the race are making is that if F1 believe this is going to make people care more about the sprints, they're probably mistaken because if anything, the new format undermines the importance of the sprint. And also to keep in mind, it's at 4am UK time. I'm not getting up for that. There's no way. I'll be there for quality at 8. The sprint is kind of now like, well, if you want to watch it, you can, but if not, you've still got a good, important session of Formula 1 happening later in the day anyway. So the race's analysis is like, well, you know, there's no longer one single narrative from the sprint. It's no longer like, okay, well, the Saturday is about two won the sprint, and then the Sunday is about two is going to be winning the Grand Prix. Now it's like there's just one narrative, and what people will really care about on the Saturday night is not to won the sprint in the morning, it's who uh, stuck it on pole for the Sunday. So, you know, I think this should be better, but I don't disagree with this assessment that if F1 thinks that these changes are going to make people care more about sprints, they just don't understand what they're doing at the moment. Ferrari are in an interesting spot this weekend because in Australia the reports were emerging after the fact that had there been a sprint in Australia they would have won easily it would have been a clear one too because Ferrari their simulation data their setup on the start of Friday was far better than where Red Bull were and they took some time to go into the weekend now Max Verstappen DNF'd Checo was miles behind bit of damage question would the Ferraris have beaten Max anyway that still, well, it's an unknown that we don't really have the answer to. But the feeling was that had Australia been a sprint, Max had effectively no chance because the Ferraris were much hotter out the gates than the Red Bull was that weekend. This weekend is a sprint weekend. They have one practice session with very underwhelming data. I mean, they haven't been here for five years. The cars are nowadays very different. The track service is different. You know, the simulations are going to have to be cracked out of their minds or very much on point to help the teams. Limited practice time. Time management's crucial. Now, the track itself should be very nice for the Red Bull. I mean, every track is going to be nice for the Red Bull. But long straights, the type of corners should favour the Red Bull in the traction zones. But then again, largely front-limited circuits. 
that is what Australia was in part, and that's where Ferrari had a better time. It will be between those two teams. I can't see anybody else mixing it up. Last year, there was times where I said, you know what, McLaren, they could be in the mix. But certainly at this track, I don't think that's the case. Their straight line speed, their DOS efficiency isn't where they need it to be. Speaking of Ferrari, though, this is now a done deal. So Loic Serra, engineer from Mercedes, bit of drama around him just because the belief is that him and Lewis Hamilton were in heavy agreement that the decisions Mercedes made on their car, certainly going into 2023, were majorly mistaken. They didn't feel, apparently, Sarah and Hamilton, that they were doing the right thing, and they apparently were rather aligned on that reality. Now, Sarah is joining Ferrari alongside Hamilton in the near future. This was actually at the start of April, right at the start of April. That's when his contract with Mercedes ended, or at least his collaboration with Mercedes ended, and he is now no longer a Mercedes engineer. He has a relatively substantial gardening leave period. That will take him, you know, six, seven, eight months or whatever until he can officially join Ferrari, but that is now on the road. It was already going to be a thing, but now he's officially left Mercedes and he's entering that gardening leave period. The same thing for Jerome D'Ambrosio, who will also arrive at Ferrari. So big scalps that Ferrari are taking away. Another scalp, of course, they want is Adrian Newey. We discussed this yesterday that all the reports are saying, yeah, Ferrari and Aston Martin have been trying their best to get Newey onto the team. This won't happen based on what we talked about yesterday until at least 2026 because Nui has a deal with Red Bull until the end of 2025 at least and you know they're not going to let him go very easily if that was to be the case. However, it may happen. There are reasons as we talked about yesterday why it might be viable and there were also rumours yesterday that he was spotted at Bologna Airport and the question was, okay, exactly why? If he's in Bologna around about this time of the year, especially given the fact that we know full well how Fred Vasseur and John Elkan were, you know, doing their best, let's say, to get Lewis Hamilton on board by doing whatever it takes effectively to make that happen. The idea of, well, Newey being just a couple of miles away from Ferrari home turf, and in Ferrari home turf to some extent, made things rather interesting. Apparently, though, he was actually there to drive some cars at Mugello, an invitation of KR Motorsports, according to the Italian press. Now, it's maybe not out of the realms of possibility, that's sure he was there to do this. But could he not also have stopped off? So here we are back on Google Maps for the second day in a row here. But this is Bologna, Bologna Airport. And uh, just northwest of there, you'll find Modena. And then just south, you will uh, run yourself into Marinello, which is right about here. Of course, all Ferrari home turf and all this type of stuff. Now, if you go south instead from Bologna Airport, you will get down to Florence. And before you get to Florence, you'll get to Mugello, which is right about here. So yeah, that's the Mugello circuit. And um, yeah, so apparently, instead of going northwest to find Modena and and uh, the Ferrari guys, he instead went south from Bologna to spend some time at Mugello. But, um, you know, is it impossible that Newey on the way back had a quick stop off at Maranello to have a couple of words with those guys? It seems rather plausible to me. Whether that actually happens, like, as I said, it's not going to happen immediately anyway. But the teams will continue to try. And if there ever was a time to try, now is obviously the time. Newey, of course, also gave his thoughts on the 2026 regulations because he's been saying a lot lately on how things have been closing up and you know, what Red Bull are thinking about going into the next set of regulations. And effectively, his opinion is, which to be fair always happens, but um, the regulations will close up. Like his feeling is the trajectory of the grid is to close up. And in terms of the front of the grid, Red Bull and Ferrari on this evidence should have a pretty reasonable title fight next year. Often it happens that way. The last year of the regulations or getting close to it's somewhat more competitive. And then the new regulations happen. Somebody nails it. Somebody definitely doesn't nail it. And you get, well, a blowing apart of the grid, as it were, which can be a good thing. It can be a bad thing. The reality is it's an inevitable thing. It's just the way that it goes in the cycle of regulations that we have in Formula One, which are a good thing fundamentally, right? I think, you know, we need to change regulations every so often, but there is maybe a trend. Let's say 2021, for example, like if the 2022 regs didn't happen the next year, you know, we could have had another year like that again. But of course that didn't happen and that raises questions as well as to, well, we know the engine is important in 2026. Christian Horner has said that their engine project Red Bull is hitting the target, which is quite an interesting way to phrase it. We know that Red Bull are partnering with Ford on their 2026 engine project. Honda are leaving. Okay, it's Red Bull powertrains right now, but basically it's Honda. They're going to be working with Aston Martin and that apparently 
is maybe where the money is. Like that could potentially be a really deadly team come 2026. And maybe it makes a fair bit of sense why Alonso has stayed. Could this be an actual good driver contract decision making here from Fernando Alonso? I hope that it's the case. But Horner says, not that they're, you know, smashing it out of the park. Not that they're doing a stellar job. He says, yeah, we're hitting the targets. And also says there is a steep learning curve with the F1 engine build. So I think this kind of, look, Horner's not gonna say that it's not going well, but the fact that he's not saying that it's going exceedingly well, has made some people question whether Red Bull are, you know, a little bit behind the curve when it comes to their 2026 development, certainly on the engine side, compared to Mercedes, compared to Ferrari, and very possibly compared to Honda, or effectively Aston Martin. And that raises some interesting questions as to what is going to happen in the driver market in the very near future, because let's be real, Verstappen isn't going to leave Red Bull to join Mercedes now. Why would he? The team's taken so many steps back. If Mercedes could show Verstappen right now that they could be a potential, you know, race winner, championship contender next season he might do it because there are other reasons why you know the Marco Horner stuff and everything we've discussed over the last couple of months but it just doesn't seem to make sense for Verstappen to leave now but in 2026 could be a different story if Mercedes can take a couple of steps in the right direction for the remainder of this season if the rumor still is that they have a very powerful engine project in the works then maybe it's plausible, given that Helmut Marco might get kicked out by Horner, and we know what Verstappen said would happen if Marco is fired, he said he'd leave. And um, I think that he probably believes that, to be honest. This is Kimi Antonelli at the Red Bull ring in the Mercedes W12. Okay, not the most pixels on this image, but uh, it is what it is. I guess here's actually another one of him in the W12 around the Red Bull ring. So they're doing the testing with Antonelli, and the feeling is from some that Wolf has made his mind up that they want to put Antonelli in the car. There is a feeling that it's not maybe much of a risk because Mercedes are struggling right now. It's a rebuilding, restructuring process anyway. So why not put a rookie in the car? That is a valid assessment, but arguably, you know, do you need a drive with more experience to help bring them back to the four? That also could be argued as well. So I think that discussion point goes both ways. And that's when, you know, even names like Mick Schumacher were thrown around. That's probably not going to happen. There's actually rumours today that's Prima, their IndyCar project, which is coming up very soon. Mick Schumacher has been rumoured over there. So that's one to stay tuned for as well. But this is what AMUS had to say today on the Alonso situation, his decision and also what it means for the rest of the grid. So, you know, the feeling is that Alonso, he knows the team that Lawrence Stroll is creating. He knows that he holds the cards on the driver's side. The feeling is that the Red Bull powertrain's conjunction with Ford Project is somewhat unknown. Honda builds engines that are just as good at, if not better, than Mercedes or Ferrari. And Aramco, the Aston Martin fuel partner, they have been providing the e-fuels for Formula One testing with the FIA. So they are ahead of the curve on that front, it seems. And AMUS believe that could well be the match winner in the first year of the new regulations. But of course, Alonso locking in, that means that there aren't many teams you can actually join right now. Especially if we assume that Lance Stroll isn't going anywhere, which it doesn't seem like that he is. So this is the debate on the Carlos Sainz question. That has got to be the next domino, I would say, to fall. Nico Hulkenberg to Audi seems locked in. That may be announced soon. That may be confirmed in the near future. I don't know. But the feeling is that Sainz... He is the one that needs to make the next decision and that will determine where he goes because apparently Toto Wolf knows that Carlos Sainz has to give Audi an answer this week. So Audi have been pushing Sainz hard because they want Sainz. No doubt they want Sainz. The relationship with Carlos Sainz Sr., you know, he can go to Audi if he wants to. But Audi, for now, are still Sauber. And right now, Sauber are kick Sauber, and they're pretty trash, right? They can't do a proper pit stop. Their car isn't terrible, but it's like if you're Sainz, do you really want to go from Ferrari, waste a year in 2025 at Sauber, and then just hope that Audi nail it out of the gate in 2026? And... There's not that much evidence that points towards that. It's very much a punt at that point. If I was Sainz, I would probably prefer going to Mercedes for a year or two and then trying to get the Red Bull seats possibly or Audi maybe at that point without having to waste a year is maybe how I'd look at it. So some decisions have to be made here. Sainz has been a driver in the past that said, you know what, I prefer to get things locked down. And he might be tempted just to sign the deal in front of him. But apparently Audi is saying, look, Sainz, make your mind up this week. To be fair, if I'm Sainz, I'm thinking... I have the cards here. I can probably push them back a bit on this. You know, do I need to give Audi an answer this week? Really? Can I push it on for another couple of weeks? 
probably, but Audi, you know, they might not be so happy about that. But of course, there is a rumour that Mercedes have given Sainz an offer, like a one plus one level deal that seems attractive, but as they go on to say, you know, maybe Sainz could switch to Audi after a year, then Verstappen could come to Merck in 2026, which is, again, not out of the realms of possibility, but it does complicate things because Audi might not want Sainz in a year, depending how he performs or how their new driver performs if they don't get Sainz alongside Hulkenberg. And then there's the question of Kimi Antonelli, and there's other sides. So, you know, does Sainz want security? If he wants this, then he probably has to lock in now, or he might buy this time a little bit longer. And obviously, Sainz has gone from being a driver that was getting kind of, well, as they described, driven into the wall by Charles Leclerc at the end of last season, following effectively Singapore from Japan onwards, to now being understandably the hottest prospect on the driver market. This is when Alex Albon comes in as well, because it wasn't long ago we were talking about Albon to Red Bull. We were even talking about Albon to Ferrari before the Hamilton thing happens, making a lot of sense. Albon has history with Vasseur, it would be plausible, and I still think Albon is a very solid to potentially good, even excellent driver. But according to AMUS, they say, after the two recent accidents in the Williams, of course, most notably in um, in Australia, he crashed the car and then it was a disaster, but then also tangling with Ricardo on the first lap in Japan. So two races in a row, things have gone wrong. Things have become quite quiet around the tie, they say. So the feeling is that, yeah, maybe Alex Albon no longer as in demand as he was previously. There is still a rumour going around that... Perez has effectively a month and a half to maintain this level. And if he can do so, they will probably keep him. But um, that's the time frame apparently that Red Bull are working with. They want to see if Perez actually has some consistency now because... Look, people are saying that Perez is doing a better job to start this season, which is absolutely true with respect to the end of last year. But let's not forget, one year ago, four races in, Perez already had a couple of race victories on the board. But um, of course, that's not the case this year. Do I feel like Perez has maybe found something in his mentality or in his driving to take a bit of a step? I think I do. Whether that's enough to maintain the consistency that Red Bull need of him from the end, you know, to the end of May is a question. And if they don't maintain Perez, Albon therefore might be a candidate. Because Red Bull have actually said they want an option on his services from 2026. But I'm not sure Albon has taken that because what is there to gain from him? Red Bull can still say no if they want to in 2026. And um, he would be therefore potentially tied to them. So that's how it kind of continues onwards. What this means for Verstappen, because let's say Sainz was to sign with Mercedes, then Verstappen wouldn't have a drive next year if Horner was to execute on seemingly his master plan, because that's what they described. Christian Horner would then have free reign to implement his plan immediately and sideline the Austrian faction, because I think for now, Horner maybe is biding his time in taking revenge against those that wanted him gone, because if he acts now then those that wanted him gone could take Verstappen with him and go to another team. Whereas if all the other teams lock down their drivers, then you know Verstappen is almost forced to stay at Red Bull, at least for the next couple of years, even if Helmut Marko was to get fired effectively. So it would make things rather interesting internally. He could suspend Helmut Marko without Verstappen being able to run away from him because the Mercedes would then be occupied by Sainz. So man, there are so many complications and factors and things that are happening behind the scenes right now that we don't get to know publicly. And uh, well, I'm sure we will get to know in due course. But that's pretty much what the article goes on to say. And also, this was another interesting point for Dana Ricardo, who is um, Horner's protege, right? The man that probably Horner would like to put in the senior team. But Red Bull apparently say that Ricardo has to be consistently three tenths faster than Sonoda to make that happen. So that shows a couple of things what he needs to do firstly, but also how they think of Sonoda, because as good as Yuki might be, and I think he's better than Red Bull think he is, to be honest, but um, the feeling is apparently from Red Bull that, yeah, you've got to be able to dunk three tenths on Sonoda to prove your Red Bull quality, which I think is very much underestimating how good Yuki actually is, but, um, you know, Ricardo ain't doing that, is he, let's be honest, so you can probably chalk that up, so that's pretty much how the article concludes, but the key point, I suppose, being Sainz needs to make a decision, and quickly, Audi are pressing him for it, if it's true, that Mercedes have given him an offer that might be very attractive and if that does happen and those seats get locked down then maybe Horner might feel in position to execute his master plan and uh, well kick out some of those that tried to undermine his position
position in the team over the last several months. So very much enjoyed to your thoughts on all this stuff in the comment section below. Just before I share this to close the video, I wanted to mention this quickly from Joe Guan Yu, of course, his home race. Finally, he gets a home race. It's actually really cool to see this. 20 years later, I'm back. And uh, here he is 20 years ago at the Journeys Grand Prix, which I believe was first held in 2004. And um, as is quite often the case, you know, you might say you're not a Ferrari fan, but uh, here he is, of course, with the Ferrari cap on. So hit the like button if you enjoyed. Subscribe if you're new. Take care. And I'll see you next time.